For my latest project, I'm going to need a red, amber, green status indicator. And in this video, I want to look at using a Raspberry Pi Pico to get those colours from a single RGB LED. The red and green should be straightforward enough, but for the amber, I'm going to need to do some colour mixing. And for that, I'm going to look at a couple of things, including a method called pulse width modulation, which sounds very technical, but is actually not that complicated. Let's start with my LED, or should I say LEDs, because actually what I've got here is a cluster of three separate ones, each emitting a different wavelength of light. And like a regular LED, each one has a cathode and an anode. They just happen to share the same cathode, leaving me with four pins, the longest being the shared cathode, with the anode for the red on one side, and those for the green and blue in that order on the other. And to control which ones are on at any one time, I'm going to be programming a Raspberry Pi Pico. The one I'm using is a Pico W, which has the distinctive metal square. Although for this project, I don't think I'll be using the Wi-Fi, and definitely not at this stage. And I've treated myself to the one with the soldered headers, which even comes with a little socket for the debug pins, which is a nice to have, but I won't be using it here. I just need those general purpose in-out pins, the GPIOs, which I'm going to push into my breadboard. Next up is my LED, the legs of which go into four adjacent columns further up the board. It helps display the legs slightly to get the right spacing and making it easier to push in. All we need to remember is which one was the cathode. I will be adding some current limiting resistors later on, but for now I'm going to wire it direct to the Pico, starting with one of the ground pins, which have the square tops spaced on either side of the board. And I'm just putting my black jumper cable between that and the cathode of my LED. Now to wire the anodes, starting with red. Each one will be connected to a 3.3 volt output pin on the Pico, switched on and off by the program. And I've chosen a set of pins on either side of the ground that match the arrangement of the legs on my LED. The red on its own on one side, the green and blue together on the other. It would also have been nice to perfectly colour code the cables, but I didn't have a green one of the right sort, so yellow will have to do. But I did have blue, so two out of three ain't bad. And with all four wires in place, it's really easy to tell what's going on. Each anode is connected to an output pin, and the common cathode connected to a negative using the black cable. As it stands, the current will be too great for the LED, so I'm just moving it forward on the breadboard to the other side of the gap in the middle, so we can add some resistors, one for each of the internal LEDs. At this point, my choice of value is a little bit random, as I don't know how bright it's going to be, or even if each colour is going to be the same but I've gone for 400 ohms for each one, and they just need to be pushed into the holes in the appropriate column, ensuring each pin, each resistor, and each jumper cable are connected correctly, and nothing's touching anything that it shouldn't. Now we mustn't forget that our black cable is still on the other side of the gap, so we just need to bring it forward and restore its connection to the common cathode. With all our wiring done, we can turn our attention to the Pico, which, fresh out of the box, first needs to be set up with MicroPython. For this we need a host computer, and I'm using a Raspberry Pi 3B, to which we connect using a micro USB cable, making sure we're holding down that boot cell button. Now, I am going to go through the whole setup process, so if you're new to the Pico, stick with me, or if this is old news, just skip ahead. The first thing we get is a removable media dialog box, and pressing OK leads us here. We can largely ignore the text file, but that other one will take us to exactly where we need to go, which is the Raspberry Pi documentation website, where we can scroll down until we see the MicroPython section, and clicking on the link takes us to where we want to be. As well as the download links themselves, there's a handy animated graphic that leads you through the installation process. But this is what we came for, the download link to the MicroPython UF2 file. Just make sure you click on the right one for your board. Downloading doesn't take long, so we can go and find the file in the downloads folder on the host computer pretty much straight away. Then let's remind ourselves what to do with it by watching that animated graphic again. And that's to drag and drop it onto the RPI RP2 listing in the top left hand pane where it will start to install. Again, this is pretty quick, and will be done in a couple of minutes. Now there's something important to notice here. That RPI RP2 removable media icon has disappeared, which begs the question, how do we get stuff on and off of our Pico? We'll get to that in a moment or two, but now we just need to close our windows. Then, from the programming menu, open Thony. And look, here on the left-hand side of the Files pane is a space for our Raspberry Pi Pico, and it's here that we're going to manage our files. If you can't see the Files pane, just activate it in the View menu, and if you can't see the Pico, exit and reload Thony. 
Now, even though we haven't written any code yet, let's go ahead and save the file. And you can see we're given an option to save it on the Pico. I would normally call it something descriptive, like rgb.py, but for a bit of code to run automatically when the Pico is powered up, which ultimately is what we're after, we have to name it main.py. And having hit the OK button, it appears in the files list for the Pico on the left hand side. And all set up, we're ready to start writing some code, starting with our basic RGB colours. As usual, we need to load up some MicroPython libraries, or at least the bits of them that we're going to need. And from Machine, the library that deals with the hardware side of things, I'm importing PIN. And from Utime, which is really just MicroPython's version of Time, I'm importing Sleep. And for the time being, that's all the library bits we need. Next, I'm going to define each of the internal LEDs in our cluster, in exactly the same way we would if there were three separate ones. So for red, I'm calling it R underscore LED, and it will be controlled by GPIO28 as an output pin. That's the one on the right-hand side of our ground. Then the green one, which uses pin 27. Notice which separators are commas and which ones are full stops. So the line should read G underscore LED equals pin with a capital P, open parenthesis, then the pin number, followed by a comma, then pin again with a capital P, full point, and then out, all caps, finishing with a close parenthesis. And that's the same for the blue one too. Now we can get them to do something. And using a while true infinite loop statement, I want my LED to flash red. So I'm giving it a value of 1. Or in other words, I'm giving pin 28, a binary output of 1, switching our LED on. And we want it to stay on for a couple of seconds. So we want our program to sleep and not go on to the next line until the duration is over. When we can change the red LED's value to 0, switching off the voltage from pin 28. So it goes out. And we want it to stay out for a second. Then the program can cycle back to the beginning of the infinite loop, switching the LED on again, endlessly repeating until something tells it to stop. Now let's get our other colours involved, and we can start to see what our LED is capable of. First of all, I just want it to cycle through the three colours. So I am copying the four lines of code for the red LED, and pasting them afterwards. Then I can change those two R's for G's for the green LED, and repeat the process for the blue one pasting the code in place and switching over the letters. So each colour will flash on and off in sequence when the program runs. First the red is on for two seconds, and then off, and then on comes the green, followed by the blue, and then back to the red via the infinite loop. Now that the program is running and showing all three colours, I've noticed one thing, and that's the green is considerably brighter than the other two. This is showing up to an extent on the camera, but is even more pronounced in real life. But obviously this is going to be a problem when it comes to colour mixing. So I want to try out some different value resistors for the green element, starting with a thousand ohms, which is two and a half times the other two. And certainly it's made an improvement, but I think an even higher value would be good. Now this is all good stuff, but let's remember my brief, which was to get traffic light colours for my red, amber, green status indicator. The red and green are fine, but I'm obviously a long way away from amber, so I need to get mixing. First of all I need to change my order, so green comes last. Then I'm going to have a look at that middle bit of code, the one for the middle light. Now I'm quite restricted with what I can do here. Each internal LED can after all only be on or off, but I can have two different ones on at the same time, or even all three, and that's going to get me some different colours. So let's see what happens when I combine the red and the green by coding them to come on together, stay on for two seconds, and then go out again. And what I'm getting is quite a nice yellow. Not too bad for the very basic on or off options I'm offered, but still not quite amber. For that, I'm going to need some more nuanced approach, which brings us to pulse width modulation. We can use the basic structure of the code we've already written, but it's going to be a pretty major makeover. So I just want to save that separately so we can remember what we did. And as it's no longer our auto start program, we can call it a more descriptive name. Then close it and reopen main, which is currently identical, but won't be for long. I will endeavor a layman's explanation of pulse width modulation or PWM as we go along, but we can start with the fact that it has its own module in the machine library, and we can add that to our import list. Essentially, what it's going to do is turn the output from our pin on and off really quickly. In other words, make it pulse, but so quickly that we don't see it. And if it's on half the time and off half the time, all our eye discerns is that it's half as bright. 
Now each of our LEDs requires two lines of code. The first one saying which pin it's going to use. Then one setting the frequency for the pulsing. This just has to be fast enough to trick the eye. And a thousand hertz is about right. Just type out the code as you see it here, making sure you get the parentheses in the right place. Now we can copy those two lines and paste in place of the original pin definition for the other colours, changing the R's to G's for the green one and making sure that the pin is the right number, which is 27 in the case of the green. And then on to the blue. I just need to mention that there is some limitation on which pins you can use for PWM, or rather the combination you can use. Essentially there are duplicates, which you can't use together, but my choice of 28, 27 and 26 will work just fine. Now for the lighting sequence part of the program, and I want to approach this in small steps so I know exactly what's going on, starting with the basics of the red light turning on and off. And instead of assigning it a value of either 1 or 0, we're going to give it a duty cycle, which will dictate how much of the time it is on and how much of the time it's off. And this value can be a 16-bit integer anywhere between 0 and 65535. A value of 65535 would mean it's on all the time, and on none of the time with a value of zero, or of course somewhere in between, with any other number in the range. And that gives us the ability to vary the brightness. So instead of just on or off, our LED can be any one of 65,536 levels of brightness, including zero. But before getting in to tweak those numbers, let's just make sure I've typed everything in correctly, and it works for a simple on and off. Now let's change that to a rather arbitrary value of 10,000, very roughly 15% of the original. And when we run the program, we can see our LED is a fraction as bright. What we've actually done is reduce the amount of time that the LED is on during each 1,000th of a second pulse, so it appears dimmer. And we can compare that to the full brightness by copying and pasting a little bit of that code and restoring the 65535. So the on bit of each pulse is now 15%, 0%, or 100%. And that's the pulse width, which we've adjusted, or in other words, modulated. So let's put our theory into practice and get back to creating our traffic light colours. The red is straightforward enough, we just want that to be on all the time. And we know from our previous experiments that the amber will be some kind of combination of the red and the green together. 100% of each gave us a kind of yellow, so let's try the green out quite a bit dimmer, starting with our 10,000, which we know is about 15%. Then we need to remember that as well as turning it on, we're going to need to turn it off again. So we need another line of code, resetting the duty cycle to zero. Now the great thing about this is that we can test it straight away, just by running the program. And we can instantly see that the red is still too dominant in the colour. We're getting a tomato rather than an amber. So we're going to have to increase the level of the green, and probably by quite a bit. So let's try it out at 45,000, and test that straight away by running the program. And instantly we can see that we're much closer, and definitely better than the 100% 100% without the PWM. Of course, as well as adjusting the green, we can also adjust the red. And as well as altering the colour mix, this will affect the brightness of the combo, giving us another axis of adjustment. Clearly we've gone back to being a bit too yellow, but the combined brightness is now closer to the red. So let's push that red value back up a little bit. We can happily mess about with this all day, continually testing as we go, but for now I'm pretty happy with that amber. Now we come to the green light, which is one of the RGB primaries it shouldn't give us too much trouble. You may remember from earlier that it appeared much brighter than the others, and I was trying out various resistors to try and balance it up, and it took a surprisingly large 5000 ohms to get it about right. With our introduction to pulse width modulation, we now know how to do this at a software level, but sorting out the hardware from the start is going to help make the numbers more intuitive, with the same value for maximum brightness for each. So I'm going to start with a duty cycle, spelt correctly of course, of 65535, the same as the red one. Then having run through the cycle of all three colours, I just want to pause for a bit longer. And this is what it looks like. I'm very happy with the red and the amber, but I think the pure RGB green is a little bit acidic. So I want to try one last thing, which is to mix in some blue and see what happens. So I'm just adding in a line of code, and then I can adjust the duty cycle. Guessing that round about 10,000 will have a similar kind of impact on my green as my first attempt at adding green to the red, which gave us that tomato-y colour, and I'll get a very slightly bluey green. 
but this is where the world of colour mixing with light throws us another surprise, and just as counterintuitive as red and green giving us orange. I actually end up with a slightly greeny blue, which is not what I expected, and obviously no good as my OK status indicator. So I'm going to try a much narrower pulse width for my blue element, reducing the value to just 100, which should be enough just to introduce a hint of turquoise. Then turning our project board on its side so we're looking straight into the lens of the LED, we can see what we've achieved. Nice, clear, red, amber and green lights. Perfect for the status indicators on my latest project. The video for that will be coming very soon, and will include wiring and coding for buttons to trigger my colours. I'll add a link as soon as it's ready, but in the meantime make sure you hit that subscribe button so you'll know when it's out.